the Williams Institute is a national research center on sexual orientation uh, and gender identity law and policy, and we've been working on research and forming marriage equality uh, really since our founding for over 15 years. Our first report uh, was a report by Lee Badgett and myself uh, informing uh, a domestic partnership law here in California in 2003. Uh, and since that report, we've done hundreds of reports. Uh, we've testified uh, before state legislatures and Congress. Uh, we've had our experts, such as Lee Badgett and Gary Gates and Alon Meyer, uh, testify as expert witnesses in court cases, all to bring to bear uh, uh, rigorous research on uh, then the question of marriage equality. Um, our research has not only been as extensive uh, as you'll see today, it's uh, reached across a number of different disciplines. Um, we were really excited uh, this year to see our research uh, cited by a number of appellate courts who ruled in favor of marriage equality, and then when briefs were submitted to the Supreme Court, over half of them cited our research and scholars. Uh, that culminated on Friday uh, to a first for the Williams Institute, uh, the citing of our research director, Gary Gates, uh, in Justice Kennedy's majority opinion. Uh, so we're excited to have you join us. Uh, please uh, type in the questions as uh, our speakers talk. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our Blanchford Cooper Distinguished Scholar and Research Director, Gary Gates. Gary? There we go. Sorry about that. Slight technical difficulty. Um, thank you very much, Brad. Uh, I appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, Lauren, if you can move to the next slide. So um, one thing I want to add to just a, perhaps to brag a little bit more about the Williams Institute. Um, I did a quick look at in Justice Kennedy's opinion, and he actually cited seven amicus briefs of which Williams Institute scholars are cited in five of those seven briefs. So I think it has been an exciting time, and I think Williams Institute and our research uh, has played a very important role in the marriage equality debates, and, and I believe now in the debates that are going to come uh, following this ruling. So one of the, I think, most important things that you caught in terms of the, the ruling around um, how Justice Kennedy was able to use our research was simply the idea that we were able to document uh, the fact that there were many same-sex couples and document their, their situation, their demographic characteristics, their economic characteristics, and the degree to which marriage might change that situation. And an example of that is in this first slide. Um, you, you see that currently um, about 18% of all same-sex couples in the United States are raising children. We now estimate, based on a, a Gallup poll finding of about a month and a half ago, we believe that there's now almost a million same-sex couples in the United States. Um, what's interesting is that already we observe, and actually, I apologize, I think the unmarried um, bar here is, is incorrect, that we observe a much higher rate of child rearing among married couples, 27%, and actually I think in unmarried couples it should be 15%. Um, but already the connection between marriage and child rearing is evident in the same-sex among same-sex couples. And as of now, we think there's probably um, more than 400,000 married same-sex couples already in the United States, perhaps 40% already married, and that's before marriage you know, has been now uh, available across the entire country. One of the interesting things in the run-up to the, um, the ruling is that in the states, in the new states, that the 13 states now that have marriage equality that didn't prior to the ruling, child rearing was actually higher among same-sex couples. And, and I think one of the most interesting findings we've observed over time is that in some of the most conservative parts of the country, same-sex couples have some of the highest rates of raising children. So Lauren, next slide. 
Um, another issue with same-sex couples is um, their racial and ethnic composition. And it has been important to note that um, to take on some of the stereotypes of the LGBT community as being um, white and, and wealthy. And um, a lot of our work challenged those assumptions. And, and what we found is that um, more than a third of same-sex couples are uh, racial or ethnic minorities. And, and this is actually uh, similar to the general population, if not somewhat higher than in the general population. What's interesting in same-sex couples so far is that the difference between married and unmarried couples in terms of those being racial or ethnic minorities isn't very, there isn't much difference. So it's a third of married and unmarried couples who identify as um, non-white. What's important to understand about that is that in the, among different sex couples, uh, married people are actually much more white than their unmarried counterparts. And we don't at the moment as yet see that racial or ethnic distinction, distinction in same-sex couples and who gets married. And again, an important um, finding in the run-up to the, the ruling on, on Friday was that almost 30, that the race of racial and ethnic minorities among same-sex couples was actually higher in the states, uh, these 13 states where um, they can newly, where marriage equality is new. And so again, this disproport that in these conservative areas that were among the holdouts for marriage equality, those were places where same-sex couples tended to be um, uh, more, there tended to be more racial and ethnic minorities among same-sex couples. So next slide, Lauren. And, and as I mentioned before, we have tried to show um, that same-sex couples are not um, particularly, and the LGBT community in general is not particularly wealthy. And in other research we've done at the Williams Institute, particularly by my colleague Lee Badgett, we've been able to show that poverty tends to be similar to or in many cases higher among LGBT populations than in the general population. And in same-sex couples, the group that we find to be amongst the most economically disadvantaged are those raising children. Um, you see that in the entire of the United States, the average household income of same-sex couples is a bit higher than that of their different sex counterparts. This may not be surprising because um, up to half of the same-sex couples have two male incomes, um, and male incomes tend to be, you know, higher uh, than in the, the general population. So that may explain at least some of that. But nonetheless, that pattern does not exist among couples raising children. Um, same-sex couples actually have lower household incomes among those raising children. And again, in the states where marriage equality is now uh, new, first of all, the gap in incomes between same-sex and different-sex couples um, was much lower, and they were much more similar. But in particular, the gap for those raising children was dramatically higher. Um, same-sex couples had only 81,000 per year average household income compared to 96,000 in their different-sex counterparts raising kids. So again, in these areas that where same-sex couples and their families had some of the greatest economic challenges, um, these are the areas that, that denied marriage equality for the longest. And there is substantial research to show that marriage is one way that uh, families can choose to help them um, create more uh, stable uh, and efficient economic environment uh, in the family. So, my last thing that I want to mention, next slide, Lauren, is just where, where do I think we go from here, at least in terms of, of uh, issues of same-sex couples and, and families. And, and again, another uh, piece that Justice Kennedy cited uh, of, in his brief was this idea that same-sex couples are disproportionately raising adopted and foster children. And you can see that... Um, among same-sex couples, particularly among married couples, they're dramatically more likely to be raising children. 
Um, the, the difference that uh, number, which actually isn't on there, is around 3%. So um, they're, they're more than five times, they're five times more likely than their different sex counterparts um, to be raising children, raising adopted children among those that have children. Um, so what does that mean for the future? Well, one of the issues is that, again, I think in these conservative areas um, that now have marriage equality, these are the places where actually adoption and foster rates among same-sex couples tend to be a little lower because they have had the steepest and highest restrictions on same-sex couples getting access to the adoption and foster care system. For instance, in the Michigan case, it's one of the states where you had to be married in order for a couple to jointly adopt their children. And since same-sex couples couldn't marry, they couldn't adopt. And I think one of the issues in the future is whether or not following marriage equality, whether in fact same-sex couples will be given the kinds of equal access to uh, the adoption and foster care system that their different sex counterparts have. Uh, we've seen already efforts to, in states, like uh, Michigan, and there's a proposed bill in Florida to um, do religious freedom exemptions uh, that will allow adoption and foster air care agencies to not serve same-sex couples if they have um, uh, religious objections uh, to doing so. And I think what that means is we already see that same-sex couples who have adopted children have much uh, substantially more economic resources than other same-sex couples. And my concern is that if they don't have very wide access to the public adoption system, that parenting, there's a potential that parenting among same-sex couples will really only be available largely uh, to, the, to the wealthy, um, to those with uh, economic privilege and economic advantage. And I think one way for us to um, mitigate that possibility is to make sure that, again, access to the least expensive way to adopt children, is, uh, which is through the public system, that that's widely available and, and equally available to same-sex couples as, as it is for different sex couples. So I will stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, we're going to turn from the impact of the case on couples and families to um, some of analysis of the reasoning behind the decision. Uh, and our next speaker is going to be incoming UCLA law faculty member and faculty chair of the Williams Institute, Doug Nijame. In addition to his comments today, I'd encourage you to read his op-ed uh, on the issue um, in the LA Times from yesterday. So, Doug. Thanks, Brad. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take a step back and go back to Friday and look more closely at the opinion um, and uh, talk about the actual reasoning in the opinion and then just make a brief suggestion about um, how important that is going forward. So the bottom line from the opinion is that states must allow same-sex couples to marry um, and also must recognize same-sex couples' marriages uh, when they move around from state to state. Uh, the constitutional interpretation that we see from the court is tied to questions about the court's authority and the role that the court should play in deciding this question. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about the constitutional principles, and uh, Nan Hunter will talk about the role of the court um, in articulating and applying those principles to this question. Uh, Justice Kennedy authored the opinion for the majority. It was a 5-4 decision, and Justice Kennedy now has authored the major gay rights uh, opinions in Romer, Lawrence, Windsor, and now Obergefell. The doctrinal basis for the decision was liberty under the 14th Amendment, um, but also equality, primarily liberty, but also equality. And so I'm going to start by talking about the liberty holding. Um, Justice Kennedy found that uh, same-sex couples uh, have a fundamental right to marry under the Due Process Clause. Um, and so it's important to see that he framed the right not as the right to same-sex marriage, which some of the dissenting uh, justices would do, but instead as a right of same-sex couples to marry just like anyone else. In fact, uh, Justice Kennedy stated that if rights were defined by who exercised them in the past, then received practices could serve as their own continued justification and new groups could not invoke rights once denied. Uh, so then Justice Kennedy very much focused on the importance of marriage, and Nan will say more about that. Um, but. Uh, also importantly emphasized that marriage's meaning has changed over time. Uh, 
Uh, and so as the meaning of marriage changes, um, how we apply that to new groups seeking to exercise the right also changes. Uh, in fact, Justice Kennedy uh, declared, changed understandings of marriage are characteristic of a nation where new dimensions of freedom become apparent to new generations, often through perspectives that begin in pleas or protests and then are considered in the political sphere and the judicial process. So again, here it's an example of how Justice Kennedy's views on how to interpret the Constitution are also tied to the role of the courts as society and the political sphere um, and the courts themselves come to understand um, what injustice looks like and how constitutional principles uh, should apply. Uh, and so it's important to step back and see that what the court is really doing here under Justice Kennedy is understanding the Constitution as a living document um, and that new groups of people, including LGBT people, can turn to the Constitution for protection even if the claims of those groups weren't contemplated by the framers of either the Constitution or um, later the 14th Amendment. At one point, Justice Kennedy states, the nature of injustice is that we may not always see it in our own times. The generations that wrote and ratified the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment did not presume to know the extent of freedom in all of its dimensions, and so they entrusted to future generations a charter protecting the right of all persons to enjoy liberty as we learn its meaning. So a dispute between the majority and the dissent is really how to interpret the Constitution, whereas the dissenters would freeze much of constitutional text um, at the time of enactment. Um, Justice Kennedy is explaining how uh, new, those principles can apply to new groups as we move forward. And so he tied his understanding of the constitutional significance of marriage really to changed understandings of LGBT people. Um, and that as we've come to understand the problems with discriminating against LGBT people, including the constitutional problems, um, we can interpret the Constitution to provide uh, protection. Justice Kennedy then explains why uh, the reasons that make marriage a fundamental right constitutionally apply equally to same-sex couples. And he emphasized um, a number of reasons here, but two are worth raising uh, specifically. One, that the right to personal choice regarding marriage um, is important to the concept of individual autonomy. And so this is really uh, Justice Kennedy's more libertarian streak, and we see him emphasizing um, individual liberty um, often. And so that's uh, bound up to the right to marry for Justice Kennedy. And then he also notes that the right to marry is that it safeguards children and families. And here's where um, Justice Kennedy wisely cites to uh, Gary Gates's brief um, and research um, but also notes that uh, procreation and child rearing are not necessary, necessary to marriage, but um, are still an important component for many uh, couples. So that's the liberty holding from Justice Kennedy. But then he ends um, with a few passages about equal protection. And reminiscent of his opinion in Lawrence versus Texas, he talks about how the due process clause and the equal protection clause are connected in a profound way, he says, though they set forth independent principles. Um, this is what Professor Lawrence Tribe has described as a double helix, um, liberty and equality. And Kennedy finds that the exclusion from marriage of same-sex couples also violates the Equal Protection Clause. I think one thing is important to note here. Um, he invokes an anti-subordination principle. Rather than focusing just on the um, purpose of the law, so he doesn't, you don't see a lot of language about animus here, as we saw in earlier opinions, what the motivations of lawmakers or voters were, but instead more on the effect. And he says, quote, the imposition of this disability on gays and lesbians serves to disrespect and subordinate them. Um, and it's really a ro more robust understanding of equal protection if we fo focus more on the effect that laws have on groups uh, rather than on just the discriminatory purpose of lawmakers. The final thing I want to note is that Justice Kennedy um, uses uh, the concept of dignity, which we see having been developed in constitutional law largely because of Justice Kennedy over the past several years. And he ends on a note of dignity, declaring that same-sex couples, quote, ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law, and the Constitution grants them that right. So we should look forward to see how much dignity continues to play a role in not just constitutional jurisprudence broadly, but specifically regarding LGBT rights. The bottom line on all these um, uh, issues that Justice Kennedy raises, liberty, equality, and dignity, is that it's important for LGBT rights beyond marriage. Uh, because these principles are interpreted in light of changing understandings um, of both the principles themselves uh, and the institutions that people are uh, asking for inclusion in, uh, LGBT people can continue to look to the Constitution for protection. So as important as this is 
to the right to marry, it also is going to be um, incredibly important to the future requests for constitutional protection that LGBT people bring to the court. And I'll stop there. I think Nan Hunter is on and is going to uh, take it from here. Yes, I think that's right. Um, but, so, um, uh, uh, Doug uh, has just given us an excellent uh, summary of uh, the opinion. And um, what I'd like to talk about is a bit more about the role of the court um, and the disagreements among among the justices about role of the court, because I think the, um, the significance uh, of this opinion is uh, as much for the continuing um, viability of the Supreme Court as, in its role to protect uh, human rights and human liberty um, in the face of uh, a majority um, uh, disapproval of, of unpopular groups uh, as it is about anything else. Now, of course, LGBT people have done a remarkable job uh, through the movement, um, supported by research uh, from the Williams Institute, uh, of changing hearts and minds. But the, the issue remains that when laws are in place uh, that have been uh, democratically enacted um, that discriminate against individuals, um, the, there is a question that's just baked into our constitutional democracy of what the role of the courts should be. And Justice Kennedy's opinion makes an eloquent uh, argument that the courts do, in fact, have such a role that it should be exercised carefully in, in limited situations, um, but that this situation uh, absolutely qualifies as an instance when it is important to do so. And on that, the, that is really the point on which um, he, his opinion triggered um, reactions and disagreement from the dissenters. I think it's interesting to note that the dissenters um, had two very different um, bases for disagreement. Um, the Chief Justice um, uh, actually uh, comes up, I think, uh, amazingly to me, uh, close to the Kennedy view um, because the Chief Justice is willing to say, yes, there should be protection for unspecified fundamental rights in the Constitution, and no, we should not end the analysis simply by looking at history and tradition, but uh, you've gotten it wrong in this instance. This is not a marriage. This is a different animal. This is same-sex marriage. And Justice Kennedy's uh, response to that is no. You look at the essential attributes of marriage, as Doug was describing, and this is a variant of marriage, just like covenant marriage, just like um, teenage marriage, just like other forms of marriage. The other dissenters, Justices Scalia, Alito, and Thomas, um, are not uh, about to go as far as Chief Justice Roberts. Justice, Justices Scalia and um, Thomas uh, view the meaning of the 14th Amendment and uh, other constitutional provisions as really frozen in time, and they defend that. Um, Justice Alito, I think, is uh, more concerned uh, with what he perceives the, uh, the threat to religious liberty. It's very interesting to me that Chief Justice Roberts did not join any of the other three um, dissenting opinions. And my hunch is that there was quite a bit of dispute among the dissenters about where they should come down. And in a way, that's, um, that's not surprising. I mean, the, the paradox of um, marriage equality as an issue, a legal issue and a political issue, has always been that it is simultaneously uh, radical and conservative. And the, um, uh, you, you see that in, uh, in Justice Kennedy's uh, language which, about marriage, which in, is a very uh, uh, you know, uh, call to uh, reinforcement of uh, fairly conservative values to some extent, it's a mixture, um, about marriage. 
and in uh, and in the you know with the accusations from some of the dissenters that this is such a radical position. The truth is, you know, it's both. Uh, depending on where you sit, uh, this is a big break with tradition. There's no question about that. Uh, but it is also a break in a tradition that allows more people access to an institution that is evolving. It's now evolved some more. Uh, some people view it as extremely conservative. I view it as um, evolving. Um, and so the, there's, a, there's a fascinating uh, dynamic uh, politically and culturally that comes out uh, throughout this opinion uh, and, and one that I think we will con see continue to be reflected uh, as the court takes up similar issues. So I will give it back to you, Brad. Uh, great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nan and Doug, for providing some analysis of uh, the decision. And I encourage you, uh, if you're listening in, to go online and read both of their commentary uh, further that they published over the last few days. We're now going to hear from a few more of our scholars here at the Williams Institute. They're each going to have a couple of minutes to talk to you about some of the other impacts and implications of the decision. And we're going to start with our Williams Institute Distinguished Scholar, uh, someone who's been working on research in this area uh, for well over 15 years, uh, including the economic impact uh, of marriage, uh, Lee Badgett. Great. Thank you all so much to uh, be able to be part of this happy conversation. I just want to make a few very quick points about what the economic impact looks like in this particular case. Let's start with the most important part, and that's really the same-sex couples. Uh, according to the Census Bureau, we have now at least 150,000 more couples who have access to marriage. And that means these folks now have access to the rights and benefits that provide stability and security for their families uh, and for themselves. Now that can range from access to health care through employers, government provided benefits like social security, taxation, the net effect is likely to be on average a, a savings of about $700 uh, in federal taxes for same-sex couples. Um, and then, you know, not that I have anything against lawyers, but it does mean that uh, same-sex couples can spend less money on, on lawyers and accountants to help them sort out their financial lives and, and uh, more on their, on their kids, on their houses, on their savings for retirement. So those are all really good and important things for, for same-sex couples. Um, secondly, we kind of ripple out from there. They're going to spend money on weddings. Happy days mean spending lots of money to invite friends and family to come celebrate. Um, we've done estimates that some of you may have seen uh, using very conservative estimates about how many same-sex couples will marry, how much they'll spend, what the spending is of the people they invite. We're talking about at least a half a billion dollars in these new states over the next uh, two to three years. In fact, it could be quite a bit more than that because we did see a huge surge in weddings post Windsor and it continues and we are talking about even more money. Um, and these states, they're still their simples waiting to, to, to spend that money to, to celebrate their marriages, but really the, the big pieces in that uh, in those new 13 states. And this is great for small businesses, florists, caterers, restaurants, bakers, hotels. These are all the kinds of small businesses that, that tend to struggle and who will likely very much welcome um, this new spending. Bigger businesses have a lot to gain as well, especially in lower administrative costs. The patchwork clause is now gone. That means all the money that they have to spend adjusting their systems, keeping up with things that are changing, that's all over with. Uh, they have fewer challenges in recruiting and retaining the best workers. And it really levels the playing fields for businesses across states, and they always like it when that happens. And then finally, the last kind of rip outward is to do with uh, government budgets. We've done lots of work at the Williams Institute on this over the years. Uh, more marrying means more taxes on, on wedding spending. Uh, so that's a big boost to both state and local governments. Um, there's less of a need for means-tested public assistance when families are stronger. That's also a gain both at the state and federal level and any other kinds of small ripple effects. So overall, my, my takeaway for you is that this is a win-win-win-win-win uh, for couples, for small businesses, for big businesses, and for government budgets. Thank you.
Great. Thanks a lot, Lee. Uh, and we're next going to turn to some of the other uh, impacts, uh, including the impact of uh, the opinion uh, and uh, the discussion about marriage on public opinion uh, with our um, public opinion director, Andrew Flores. Thanks, Brad. Uh, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to share with you some of what we have learned about public opinion on same-sex marriage. Um, I'll show uh, general national trends statewide trends and uh, discuss uh, existing findings about how people may react to the U.S. Supreme Court decision. And finally, I'll just point out how attitudes on marriage equality may translate to other areas of LGBT rights. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> First, attitudes on marriage equality have changed at an accelerated and some have said unprecedented rate. Plotted here are results from several polls asking people their attitudes on marriage equality. Blue, uh, uh, the, the blue represent the, po uh, the percent of the population in favor, and the, the gold and yellow uh, represent the percent that are opposed. Studies have suggested that about one-third of the overall change that we have seen uh, has been due to younger generations entering adulthood. But this also means that the remaining 66% of the change is due to people changing their own minds. Uh, next slide. And this is not unique to people living in the northwest or western parts of the United States. Attitudes have been changing at an accelerated pace all across the United States. This plot shows how attitudes have shifted in every state since 1992. Note that the far right, every state is deep blue. The deepness of that blue indicates how far each state has shifted from where it was in 1992. No matter which state, people have changed their minds. Uh, next slide. Now let's focus specifically about the recent decision and what impact the court may have on people's attitudes towards marriage equality. A long-standing idea about people's opinions on these issues is that they will lash back. That is, that support will decrease following the court's decision. One recently published study shows that when people are told that a court legalized marriage equality, their attitudes are no different compared to those who were not told that story. Here, the red dot represents the difference in support for marriage equality between those that were given this story and those that were not. And the difference is not existing. Next slide, please. Outside of experimental studies, we can learn from the 2013 decisions to understand what is most likely to happen after this decision. My own research has analyzed where people were in 2012 on marriage equality and their general feelings towards lesbians and gay men, and re-asked them after the U.S. Supreme Court made its decisions on DOMA and Prop 8. I find overall that most people shift positively in their attitudes. Here, the red is those who are entirely opposed, gray is somewhere in the middle, and blue is entirely supportive. The arrows pointing up and their numbers represent the percentage of individuals who positively changed their attitudes in this time span. And 31% of them shifted upward. Uh, next slide, please. In this same time frame, some people had marriages for same-sex couples legalized by courts and ballot initiatives. As opposed to any kind of backlash, I actually find the largest amount of positive change. 47% of those moved away from being more opposed to marriage equality. If anything, to paraphrase a portion of Chief Justice Roberts' dissent, that the decision will for many cast a cloud over same-sex marriage, making it much more difficult to accept. What we know from the, from the research that I'm presenting today is that the court's role in the public dialogue is likely to continue, and it's going to continue to foster the positive attitude changes that we have seen. Next slide, please. Since the decision has been uh, some, uh, since there's been some discussion about where the LGBT rights movement may go after marriage, uh, when thinking about positive attitude changes are, uh, that Americans are experiencing on marriage, it is important to consider whether these changes are solely on marriage equality or if they translate to other areas of LGBT rights. And I find that they do. Here I applauded the relationship between attitudes on marriage equality and attitudes on a transgender inclusive employment non-discrimination law. The relationship is quite clear. Marriage equality supporters, and even more so, strong marriage supporters, will continue to be a key group of supporters on other LGBT rights. So as you look forward, the changes in public opinion on marriage equality are important in explaining what the landscape of opinion will look like in the future. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. We really appreciate that. We're now going to turn from the impact of the decision 
um, on public opinion to health and well-being with our Williams Distinguished Scholar, um, Alon Meyer. Thank you. Um, there has been a long history of homophobic stereotypes that devalue gay and lesbian relationships, and in this, gay and lesbian people themselves. In this popular 1970s book, a medical doctor had this to say about gay relationships, or as he called it, homosexuals who live together. Live together, yes. Happily, hardly. Of course, many LGBT people then and now have formed happy relations, whether in couples or other families of choice. But the message that gay and straight people alike got was that gay people cannot have intimate relationships, and indeed, that they are not deserving of them. Justice Kennedy couched the court's opinion in this history, noting that the argument that gay and lesbian people had the just claim to dignity was in conflict with both law and widespread conventions. In my research, I had described how minority stress, the stress that stems from stigma and homophobia, can be damaging to LGBT people's health. Many studies have shown that minority stress is related to mental and physical health problems, suicide, and many other negative outcomes in LGBT populations. In contrast, when stigma is reduced, health improves. Referring to this stigma, I discussed sociologist Merton's concept of the opportunity structure, which describes how people are shut off from succeeding in society because social institutions and structures that help most people are not available to them. It is important to note that the stigma about same-sex intimate relationships created barriers not only to the institution of marriage, but more broadly to a sense that as an LGBT person, one can develop healthily and succeed in society. Friday's core chips at the stigma and reorganizes the opportunity structure for LGBT people in American society. The opportunity structure has now been reshaped not only for those who want to get married, but for all people, straight and gay, as they learn about the dignity and bond between two men and two women, to use the court word. This sends an incredible message to young LGBT people, as well as to their straight families. As LGBT youth begin to explore what opportunities are available to them, they will see a more accepting society than the generation of LGBT people today. But as recent events have painfully demonstrated to us regarding racism, a change in law does not cure stigma and prejudice in society. We must recognize that the court's decision will only have limited impact on our society if it is not followed by further work to dismantle homophobia and stigma. Now it remains to be seen whether this significant change in law will reduce social stigma. If it does, we would see related reduction in health disparities. We will be eagerly studying this effect. Great, thank you so much, Alon. Um, I'm just gonna remind you, since we're now at our last speaker, that if you have questions, to go ahead and type them in. Uh, and uh, after our last speaker finishes, uh, Gary will come back on uh, to help uh, address some of those questions. Uh, but now we're going to go from the case and kind of its immediate impacts into its implications for the future uh, with our senior counsel and Arnold D. Kusoy, scholar of law, Adam Romero. Thank you. Um, the question of sort of where do we go from here from the Supreme Court's decision, of, of course, is so important. And while we celebrate the court's opinion, there's a ton of work to be done, um, first of which is, of course, implementation of the court's uh, marriage decision. We're seeing, um, you know, the, the uh, opinion needs to be applied uh, to the remaining states that still have bans uh, in effect, and that hopefully will happen over the next uh, weeks and months. But what we're also seeing, of course, is some resistance from state officials to the Supreme Court's decision. Just yesterday, the Attorney General of Texas issued an opinion to uh, clerks who issue marriage licenses in the state, essentially uh, enabling them or encouraging them 
to resist the Supreme Court's decision to the extent that they have religious uh, objections. And so in uh, a press release, he actually noted um, th that, you know, he, that, well, uh, clerks who refuse to issue licenses may face litigation or a fine. There's sort of many lawyers who are able uh, to assist them in what he, defending their religious beliefs, as, as, as he writes. Um, and so I think what we're going to see over um, the next weeks, months, if not years, is continued um, sort of litigation over religious issues. And I'll turn to that um, uh, more in a second. But Lauren, if you could switch the slides. One of the other sort of very important areas where we're going to see um, increased attention and where we have a ton of work still to do uh, in the LGBT movement is res with respect to non-discrimination protections, uh, laws that would protect um, LGBT people from employment discrimination, housing discrimination, um, also in credit, public accommodations, and other settings. And what this map shows here is sort of the patchwork of uh, protections uh, at the state level. As everyone probably knows, there's no federal statute that explicitly enumerates sexual orientation or gender identity um, as prohibited grounds for discrimination in employment, housing, and the other settings that I mentioned. But there are uh, state-level protections, including um, on, on this map, which you can see is the darker colors represent sort of increased protections. And as the color gets lighter on this map, it's fewer and fewer protections. And so what we see is with the darkest color, uh, colored states, there's seven, 17 states prohibit sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, and other settings. Um, in addition, two states, uh, Massachusetts and Utah, prohibit sex, such discrimination um, except gender identity discrimination in public accommodations. Also, Utah does not prohibit sexual orientation discrimination in public accommodations. And then uh, third, at the statutory level, there are three states that prohibit only sexual orientation discrimination, uh, but not gender identity discrimination, and that's uh, New Hampshire, New York, and Wisconsin. In addition, there's um, 11 states that offer some protections to public employees, but not private employees. And I'll just note there, uh, of course, is while we can make advances, there are retreats as well. So Kansas, for example, uh, 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 Governor Sebelius had uh, offered some protections to state employees from sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination, uh, uh, but Governor Brownback recently repealed that uh, uh, order from Secretary Sebelius. So we could, uh, well, actually, before we move on, let me just note, uh, of course, the Williams Institute has been doing um, work uh, in this area, research in this area for uh, since our uh, beginning, and we continue to do um, research documenting discrimination in a number of different ways, including state-level reports, which uh, you can find on our website, um, which sort of uh, describe discrimination at the state level and uh, also describe protections that may be available. We're also, of course, working to improve data collection at the federal and state level so that we can better understand the magnitude and contours of uh, discrimination facing LGBT people. Um, and if we could uh, move to the next slide, let me just quickly describe. Um, while I noted before that uh, there's not uh, any federal statute that explicitly enumerates sexual orientation or gender identity as prohibited grounds for these areas of discrimination, there are there is uh, a patchwork of federal protections, starting with uh, executive orders issued by President Clinton and President Obama. Uh, federal civilian employees are now protected from sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination, and uh, employees of federal contractors are also protected from uh, sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination under an executive order that President Obama issued last July. And research from the Institute shows that that, uh, that executive order, the federal contractor executive order, extends protections to 11 million workers on the basis of sexual orientation and 14 million workers on the basis of gender identity. Going down from the executive orders, we have the Department of Labor, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, which implements uh, 
the uh, uh, federal contractor executive order, um, and people who experience sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination uh, can file com uh, can file complaints with uh, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs in order to, um, and uh, the Department of Labor, Labor will investigate those complaints. In addition, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission really has been leading the way in terms of interpreting Title VII, which is the federal statute that prohibits employment discrimination, to cover gender identity and to a lesser extent sexual orientation discrimination. And what the EEOC has done is to interpret the existing sex discrimination prohibition in Title VII to cover uh, gender identity discrimination, including discrimination on the basis of transgender status and certain forms of sexual orientation discrimination. And we're seeing similar uh, uh, actions being taken by other federal agencies. I've just listed a, a few more here, including uh, HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development, Department of Agriculture, um, and then also the Violence Against Women Act uh, also uh, prohibit sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination. And so um, if we can move to the next slide. As I mentioned before, um, we're, we're going to, I think, see increased um, discussion and debate, and of course litigation is over uh, religious objections to LGBT rights and how to properly balance uh, religious liberty and religious exercise with um, uh, same-sex couples' rights and LGBT people's rights. And so at the federal level, there's the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, um, which uh, I've, we've given you the, um, the text of the statute here. It was passed in 1993, and it was really intended, it was in response to a Supreme Court decision and intended to increase protections uh, to religious exercise. However, uh, many now see the federal RIFRA as going much further than the law was originally intended. And here we can point to the Supreme Court's recent decision from last year in the Hobby Lobby decision, which um, extended the RIFRA to certain corporations um, with religious objections to uh, contraception protection, uh, contraception, uh, the contraception mandate in the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, and if you could move on to the next slide. So, uh, of course, in addition to the federal effort, we're seeing these similar sort of laws at the state level. And here, since 1993, 21 states have enacted legislation um, mirroring or potentially going further than the federal uh, Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act. And so we're not only going to see uh, sort of litigation over the federal RIFRA, but also at the state level. Um, and I think with that, I will turn it back to Brad. Great, thanks so much, Adam. Um, and I'm actually gonna turn it back to Gary uh, to help uh, moderate the questions. But first, I just wanted to thank uh, all of the speakers for doing an excellent job uh, on the call. And Gary, if you wanna take it from here with the questions. Great, thank you, Brad. Um, I think the first question we have goes to, to Doug or perhaps uh, some of the other lawyers on the call which is whether it's fair to anticipate we will now see a rash of slippery slope suits, um, polygamous marriage, right to marry your dog, et cetera. And the degree, the questioner was wondering what, uh, whether Kennedy's opinion creates a bulwark against such lawsuits. So I can start with that and others can chime in if they want. Um, just one thing I didn't mention in the opinion is Justice Kennedy um, uh, repeatedly refers to uh, two people in marriage, and, and quotes language from Griswold versus Connecticut, the decision um, finding that Connecticut's ban on sale, of sale and use of contraceptives was unconstitutional, um, talking about the bilateral loyalty that marriage represents. Um, so Justice Kennedy was, was um, definitely using the language of coupling, and Justice, Chief Justice Roberts in his dissent pointed this out and talked about um, what the, that there was not, for him, a logical principle to divide plural marriage, multiple partner marriage from same-sex marriage. Um, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, however, cited the Brown versus Unum case in the Tenth Circuit. That case is not about multiple partner marriage. It's about the state criminalizing um, cohabitation by someone who's married with uh, more than one person. Um, so it's not about the state recognition of marriage. Certainly, we could see lawsuits, um, but the only way in which uh, these claims would be viable as if there's some um, 
broad-based movement behind them and people start to mobilize around it, and that we're not seeing yet, so we'll have to stay tuned. Um, but I think at this point, I'm not confident that there's uh, a lot behind um, slippery slope suits that might follow in the wake of this. I would agree with that. This is Nan. Um, that uh, I mean, something like you know, um, marriage to one's pet. I mean, it's just absurd. A court is not going to spend its time. Somebody might file papers making that claim, but um, that would it would just be a, a circus that would that would uh, be closed quite quickly. Um, on the issue of plural marriage, I think it's a you know it's a more difficult issue. I think in, um, you know there there's certainly important state interest. Um, that could be um, invoked to justify a different treatment of it. I, th I think the, the um, most uh, serious challenge along those lines is likely to be on, uh, based on free exercise of religion, um, both uh, by persons within the United States and, and perhaps even more so by persons who marry outside the United States. Uh, and who will have plural marriage recognized uh, when they move to the United States. I don't think it's going to succeed because I think so much of the administrative and material um, benefit structure of marriage is conditioned on the idea that there are two partners. And uh, when you get into inheritance rights and property rights, uh, a lot of that, I think, would break down um, in the instance of plural marriage. Um, but I do think that there's an international component to this that, that might uh, occur eventually. So thank you, Nan and Doug. Another question was raised about the degree to which uh, same-sex couples and married couples, married same-sex couples are Latino or Latina. Um, and, and what we find is that it's basically the exact same pattern as different sex couples. So about 11% of people in same-sex couples are Hispanic compared to 13% in different sex couples. Um, one difference between different sex couples and same sex couples is that among unmarried different sex couples in the US, almost 20% are Hispanic compared to just 12% among married different sex couples. That doesn't vary much in same sex couples, at least as of yet. Um, the percentage of uh, Latinos or Latinas among same-sex couples who are married or unmarried, it's 10% among married and 12% among unmarried, so statistically pretty much uh, the same. Uh, another question that we had, and I think I know the short answer to this, but the lawyers can, can comment further, is uh, whether any of the majority justices wrote about the decision, and if so, um, what they had to say that was different from Kennedy. Uh, my understanding is that none of them have. I don't know if they've made any other comments since. Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, you're correct. There's only one uh, opinion for the court, and that is Justice Kennedy's opinion. There were no concurring opinions. Very good. Um, and, and I guess one other question I had was uh, actually to Elon, which was, um, you know, you raised the issue of the degree to which um, these various formal equality can, um, can reduce social stigma. I wonder if you can comment just briefly on, on some of the research that we already have that, that actually does suggest that there may be a role um, in, in not only in social acceptance, but also in actually the policy climate uh, that can have an effect on LGBT health. Absolutely. As I mentioned very briefly in my presentation, uh, we have seen evidence, as in the past 10 years, certainly, there have been uh, states and uh, cities where, and counties where stigma was uh, changed by law. And uh, there's been a lot of evidence now, a lot of work by actually Mark Hatton Miller at Columbia University that compared uh, regions, uh, whether it was states or, or counties or uh, within cities, uh, that, that, that tested the effect of what happens after the law is changed and uh, what happens when uh, more protective uh, uh, legal and, and the policy changes occur. And this evidence is pretty significant and consistent in showing that the health of LGBT uh, also people improve. So 
as I said, we would expect to see that. We would expect to see a reduction in health disparities in young people as we move forward, uh, and, and possibly also in, in not young people, uh, but I'm mentioning young people because they're really growing up in this new environment. Uh, but also, as I said, we know that the law is not the ultimate uh, 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 reason for stigma or, or not the only reason for stigma, and so we will still have to see how stigma is reduced uh, with the changes in the law. Thank you, Alon. And we now have a couple more questions, I think mostly to the, the lawyers in the group. Uh, the first is what would happen if a couple marries in a state um, where there is no protection around employment discrimination, would they be able to sue the employer for firing them on the ground that they were ex exercising a fundamental right, that is to marry? Um, and would that kind of discrimination result in courts applying a higher level of scrutiny? And while we're on to scrutiny, there's another question about the degree to which scrutiny entered the opinions uh, at all. So I'll turn it over, maybe Doug, if you want to start, but Nan and Adam, if you'd like to weigh in. Yeah, so I can start, though I think um, probably Adam can talk about the employment discrimination issues. I'll just yeah. say on the tiers of scrutiny, um, we didn't get anything uh, in Justice to Kennedy's opinion that um, as the plaintiffs and the U.S. Uh, government wanted um, on equal protection and specifically the question of what level of scrutiny sexual orientation should get, whether it should be um, treated like other suspect or quasi-suspect classifications, um, including race or gender. Um, but I do think it's important to emphasize that even though Justice Kennedy didn't speak in the language of tiers of scrutiny, um, he did speak in the language of anti-subordination, um, which suggests that there is traction for future equality claims for uh, LGBT people. Thank you, just, Adam. Oh, go ahead, Nan. Sorry. I, I just wanted to point out in, in, um, uh, the difference between public um, sector employees and private sector employees. If it's a public sector job, then the Constitution does apply. Um, but even if it's a private sector job, and Adam will uh, elaborate on this, I, I, I can't resist getting in uh, this point, which is that the person should uh, take herself or himself down to the local um, uh, EEOC office and, um, or the web uh, and file a complaint um, uh, on grounds of uh, discrimination, but uh, you may well be covered and you may well have a remedy if you pursue that course. And, I, and Adam. This is, this is Adam. I, I, Nan pretty much uh, covered it, but Lauren, if you just go back to the map of um, my, fir my first slide. Correct. So if somebody's in a state without uh, statutory protections, um, as Nan said, the Constitution only protects against government forms of discrimination. And so if somebody is working for a private employer, the, essentially the Constitution doesn't have anything to say about that. And so that's why the statutory protections are so important and why it's so meaningful in the states without statutory protections that people uh, really are in danger. But we have to emphasize, as Nan said, now that the EEOC is, an inter is interpreting the federal statute, uh, statute's protections against sex discrimination to cover se uh, gender identity discrimination and s uh, certain forms of sexual orientation discrimination, people should file complaints with the EEOC, and uh, it may be that there are statutory protections available uh, at the federal level um, uh, include or at the state level if it uh, occurs in a state with, uh, with protections. Thank you. And I think we have one last question and then we'll wrap it up. And that has to do with, and again, I think we go mostly to the lawyers, this issue of how the court balance um, their views on, on marriage vis-a-vis -vis what religious institutions were saying about marriage and, and what their rationale was uh, relative to what many of the religious groups were saying about marriage. I, I can start here and then uh, hear what others have to say. Um, it's important to note that the dissents made much of the religious liberty arguments. Um, there were both, before the court, there were both arguments that religious liberty justified the exclusion from same-sex marriage, that it um, either justified the court not deciding the question or to maintain a exclusion uh, from marriage for same-sex couples. 
and also arguments prominently put forward by uh, religious liberty scholar Doug Laycock that the court should recognize the right to marry for same-sex couples, but also recognize, quote, the liberty interests on the other side um, by religious objectors. And Justice Kennedy uh, did not um, do much on that ground. So Justice Kennedy recognized that people with sincere religious beliefs object to same-sex marriage, um, and he said they have the rights to uh, keep um, engaging in speech that, rec that uh, expresses their views and that they're protected by the First Amendment, but he didn't go beyond that um, to talk about um, additional religious liberty protections, um, much to the dissenters' dismay. And I also want to point out that he also talked about the dignitary harm that same-sex couples experience when they're excluded from marriage um, and when that has the state's sanction. Um, and that might be important as we move forward and we see claims for religious exemption um, to see that Justice Kennedy and the majority of the court actually take seriously not just the material harms that couples may experience, but also the dignitary harms when, for instance, they are refused goods or services. Any other comments on that? If not, then we'll close out. Thank you all so very much for being with us. And um, it's been an exciting few days. And uh, please continue to follow us at the Williams Institute. I'm sure we'll have many more webinars in the future on interesting topics. So thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone.